Hello, my name is Brent Freen. I'm the host for Canadians with Disabilities and Their Allies. The show is also known as PWD Allies Podcast. Check it out on your favorite app, wherever you find it best suited for you. Now, please subscribe to the channel if you like the content that you are watching today or on future podcasts. Uh, it's greatly appreciated and thank you very much on that. And today I, I am really pleased to announce two awesome gentlemen that are joining me. I have Michael Prince and Neil Belange uh, joining me today. Um, it is just such a great pleasure having these uh, two uh, join me. And uh, today uh, the show is going to be talking about MAID and the Canada Disability Benefits. Uh, and from that, I'm going to pass the mic over to you, Neil. Uh, Neil Matheson. <laughs> just a big character. Oh. We got we got Neil. Oh. Matheson. <laughs> that's good that's good i wasn't sure what to say <laughs> okay. we got two meals in the house today well well actually i mean it's i think it's going to be a, a great conversation and the, and the reason why i mean we've wanted to get uh neil neil, neil too on for for a while neil neil Balanji on for quite a while yes and uh you know, one thing that's one thing that I really respect uh, you about you, Neil, is uh, you're very outspoken about about Maid, and I, I'm no longer about, I'm no longer on Twitter because of the toxicity of, of Twitter. But I remember I remember like I would follow you in your your comments of, of, on Maid, and I always thought that you were very outspoken, but you like you didn't you never said anything really inflammatory or or uh you know i think that's a, a problem sometimes when uh like these hot button issues that people just uh say things to say things and and uh you know uh and i i was you were you always stayed in within your wheelhouse and and just mm -hmm. kind of stayed stated things the, for the way they for the way they are and that's why i really appreciate that when i when i saw that Mm -hmm. and so I just wanted to say that first of all, and and the other thing is uh, a couple podcasts ago we had um, Megan Gilmore on mm -hmm. from from uh, Canadian Affairs, and mm -hmm. one of the comments she made uh, was that she said, uh, you know, there's an intersectionality between Canada Disability Benefit and and MAID, and uh, but she says, but there shouldn't be. She says she she spends a lot of time trying to pull them pull them apart mm -hmm. and she says that the that the disability advo advocacy community uh always seems to uh be blamed for putting these two two things together and and then but she's saying in reality it's actually the government <laughs> it's the federal government that's that's put the, put those two together more than more than the uh, advo advocacy groups so i thought that we we mm -hmm. could talk about that a little bit um mm -hmm. You know, I just thought it would be an interesting conversation. Yeah, exactly, Neil. And I, I remember a lot of discussions way back when. It just seems like mm -hmm. such a long time ago, way back in uh, you know, the uh, Twitter sphere, back in the uh, Twitter spaces, uh, when, um, Neil, like you would come and join the, in the conversation regarding MAID and uh, the, the kind of the parallel with, with the, you know, MAID shouldn't be like, the last resort i mean it should be aid before maid right i mean um but the and, and of course yeah that's when they uh when that track two got introduced and uh with, with that I, I will pass the mic over to you uh neil to kind of start the uh conversation off on this and, and and maybe and maybe as uh neil's getting introduced uh yeah. maybe that's a good opportunity to just tell people who you are the people that don't know you and then and then when yeah. uh michael Michael chimes in. He can do the same thing. He can give, he can yeah. give his uh, sure. Cole's notes introduction too. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. And and thanks, um, Brent and Neil. One, there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, and 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 I'm and I'm glad I could could make it here tonight. And I'm calling in from the traditional territories of the Esquimalt and Songhees people here in uh, in Victoria. Um, so uh, during my day job, I, I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Indigenous Disability Canada and the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability Society, where we are a service provider. Uh, we've been providing services for over the past uh, 31 years um, here in British Columbia, and we have offices in Ottawa as well. And we work in a variety of areas, ranging from persons with disability benefit application adjudication for uh, the majority of First Nations here in BC, to the RDSP program, disability case management management, Jordan's principal, 
we do research and and uh, a number of other items there going uh like i said for the last 31 years so yeah wow that's a lot of accomplishments and a lot a lot on the go we got a good team here so it makes the life yeah. a little bit more easy so awesome awesome all right and uh over, over to you michael uh, hello, Michael Prince here, and uh, great to be on the show again, Brent. Always uh, happy to be on the show and talk about Thanks. issues that are important, obviously, not only to you and your show, and I want to just hold my hands up to honor you and your good work, Brent, over the last years or so. And, you know, kind of sad that we've got to continue to uh, talk about some of these issues that we hoped uh, in the last budget in April by the federal government was going to give us a, a much more encouraging signal, certainly on the Canada Disability Benefit. But in my day job, I, I work at the University of Victoria. I, my areas, among other things, disability policy, community living, social policy in Canada. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Neil Boulanger, Neil II, uh, for a number of years now, and uh, a good friend and a good ally on, on these good issues. And he's more expert on the question of made than I certainly am, but happy to explore the inter intersection between that and the Canada Disability Benefit and why, I guess, why so many of us are so disappointed in what we learned about the Canada Disability Benefit, because it just seemed to reinforce the concern that uh, the federal government seemed more interested in making uh, euthanasia or assisted death uh, easier for Canadians with disabilities than to provide uh, a decent income support program that would actually give people some security in their lives and a sense of hope and dignity. And uh, uh, regrettably, the, the April budget fell well short of that kind of expectation that pretty well everybody across the country had about this benefit. So happy to delve into that more over your show today, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, that you know, people are suffering across uh, Canada so greatly. And as we know, it, as we all age, we get more disabilities, either they're, uh, you know, they're more physical or mental or mm -hmm. whatever, or you know, different cognitive disabilities that definitely, I mean, they, that doesn't go away. Like disabilities mm -hmm. don't go away at uh, age 65 either. Like they mm -hmm. continue on as we get older, they, we get more of them. And, um, and that's another a barrier that I see in the Canada disability benefit too. Um, because once you reach that age, then they say, well, you, your disabilities, uh, you know, financially are, are to go away. Um, and I think that's another huge uh, issue that I want to kind of bring up and talk about too. Sure. Well, I, you know, I, I just speak on that one. Um, yeah. You know, I've seen research and it's, it's not the most up to date. It's, it's a bit old Brent, but uh, research that showed that the, the poverty rate between Canadians with disabilities and Canadians without disabilities. And, and Neil can speak to indigenous peoples because there the poverty rate is even higher, maybe three mm -hmm. times or four times what it is of uh uh, non-Indigenous peoples without disabilities, but Canadians in general who live with disabilities, their poverty rate while they're adults of working age between say 18 and 65 is two, two and a half times higher than it is for Canadians without disabilities. At age 65, that difference almost disappears. And the reason for that is, is if people can survive 265 living on provincial social assistance and other income supports, they then at 65 qualify for old age security and usually the guaranteed income supplement, which is a targeted program for low income seniors. And the gap in poverty virtually is gone. And so the thing about, so the Canada Disability Benefits targeted at people 18 to 64 on the grounds that if you get to 65, you'll be on other income programs for seniors in general. The poverty rate there is pretty well comparable. The sad or disappointing thing about the Canada Disability Benefit is that people like Neil and I and others have been advocating for a benefit amount that would be comparable to the old age security guaranteed income supplement. In other words, provide Canadians of working age with disabilities the same safety net of income support that you would do with seniors of low income. And there, that would have made a major impact on poverty reduction in this country. That we all would have been dancing in the streets and cheering if that's what we would heard, or even something remotely close to that. This is so far off that vision and that expectation. And in the budget, there's just this vague statement about an aspiration towards yeah. moving Canada disability benefit towards what seniors get. 
there's no timeline. There's no schedule. There's no milestones. We've got lots of timelines around made. We've got lots of plans about track two and this and that. Yeah. And we look over here on, on the aid side, on the assistance side, and you just get some words. And as Neil has tweeted and texted about, you know, words without action are just, I think, uh, wishful thinking. He's got a better line than me on that. But <laughs> it, it was a very insulting it was shocking what we saw in the budget, but it was also incredibly insulting and demoralizing to see the lack of any commitment to a multi-year plan. I would have thought that they knew this amount was so small that they would have tried to cover their ass by at least saying, I know it's low, but we've got a three or five year plan and we're going to do it in installments and just stick with us, be patient. You know, we're going to get there. Here's the plan. No plan. <laughs> well, no. I, I, again, I don't know if you, if both of you have been following the last couple of podcasts, but uh, I I have a theory and I don't know if it's true or not, but I have a theory that there was kind of a bait and switch that went on uh, because we all know that with Carla Qualtro, uh, it seemed that uh, there was a more um, clear understanding, uh, like when she, when she took the file on of the C, of the CDB, there was a clear understanding of this benefit was going to be a poverty a poverty level benefit to get people to lift people out of poverty. So it was going to be at least at least at the poverty level, and mm -hmm. then slowly over time the the narrative just slowly changed where it was like it first it first was like it's going to help yeah. a, it was going to help a 1.5 million people and then it was going to be it's going to help you know 100,000 people then it's going to it's going to be it's going to help tens of thousands so the narrative kept changing it kept going yeah. down and down mm -hmm. and down yeah. and and it seems like like uh, and there's there's going to be some people that are watching that don't know this as well, uh, Michael, that, that you actually submitted your resignation because um, right. you were one you were one of the advisors for for the for the CDB. So uh, maybe you can talk about that as to why you uh, why you did your resignation. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So uh, and I should mention Neil as well. We both had the honor of being appointed to a ministerial advisory group on disability issues uh, back in April 2020 at the beginning of COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. The then minister responsible for disability issues was Carla Qualtro. Um, uh, both Neil and I were known to, to Minister Qualtro in our, our respective work. And uh, mm -hmm. uh, certainly for me, it was a personal honor to be asked. I mean, and I think for Neil too, because most of the people on the group represent and do represent uh, national organizations like Neil does. Um, Anyways, fast forward, we did some good work during the early years of COVID. Um, and then we had a change in ministers, as you say, Neil Matheson, around uh, last year, and, and Carla Qualtro in a cabinet shuffle. Most of us were quite stunned with that. We expected that even if she got shuffled to another portfolio, she would have retained the disability file, or she would have yeah. retained responsibility for this legislation. Uh, she didn't. So that that you're right, that sent a lot of concern, a ripple of concern through a lot of uh, groups and individuals in the disability community. You know, what did it mean as she was replaced by a far more junior minister? Anyways, uh, to be very clear, I, I didn't have much input into the final design of the Canada Disability Benefit. I, I sure shared a lot of public information early on when Neil and I were on the committee together. Uh, we worked very hard on encouraging the government of Canada to respond much more quickly than they did and in a much more robust way than a one-time $600 monthly payment to some Canadians with disabilities through the DTC. Again, mm -hmm. Neil's organization and others worked really hard in encouraging more people to apply for a DTC to get the eligibility numbers up so that there would at least be, even if we we're going to use this flawed policy, we try to get at least as many people in the door as possible in a quick way and so kudos to BCANs and other organizations across the country doing that. Mm -hmm. But we just thought, okay, that was a one-off emergency. Nobody thought that they would do that again in 2024 yeah. after, after a couple of years of at least or more of consultations with the disability communities, uh, research, analysis, advice. Uh, at a minimum, we thought, some of us thought, well, maybe they'll just start with federal programs. So maybe they'll look at... Uh, if you qualify for the veterans benefit or if you qualify for Canada Pension Plan disability and if you qualify for DTC or if you qualify for the post-secondary education 
students with permanent disabilities program. There's four or five federal programs. Let's say we just fold all those groups in. Uh, some of us thought, well, that's not perfect, but well, you know, they didn't even do that. <laughs> they just relied on the one program. And that's yeah. why we've got such a low number of people. So this was like the lowest of the low and after three or four years. So when the budget came out on that Tuesday, uh, that night I started to write some thoughts about it. I think I spoke to Neil the next day, either by phone. I, I believe Neil, we had a chat and I just sort of expressed my disappointments. And later that night, I just sort of thought, uh, I don't know if I can stay on the committee because uh, people are gonna assume uh, I, I'm okay with this. And if I don't speak out, uh, they're going to assume that maybe we gave the advice to the government on this and that that's part of what our job was. So the next day I realized, I know I've got to resign. And then I realized I got advice that go public, because if you resign and just send in a message to the minister and uh, you might get a letter in two or three or four months politely saying, thank you for your service, a letter written by a bureaucrat. <laughs> with maybe the minister's signature stamped on it from a machine and yeah. that would be it. And, you know, uh, so I thought, well, you're right. So I, I, I gave a courtesy heads up to the minister. I sent a letter to her, but then within an hour or so I made it public and I put it on Twitter now known as X. And I'll tell you, it just went, uh, the last count was about 115,000 impressions on that email. Wow. And, wow. uh, and uh, you know, I thought I'd, I was crossing my fingers. I was hoping I'd get a little bit of media attention. And, and I, I, I got a fair bit for about a week. And that's, that's a good run in the world of media. <laughs> I yeah. mean, you know, stories move on. But um, I was on a show with the minister and she went before me. And uh, it was painful to watch her talk because she had her speaking notes and she kind of read yeah. them and she stuck to them. It was clear that she wasn't that well informed. I suspect that the number in the budget, this measly $200 maximum for some people with disabilities that they might get next summer in 2025, this right. was not the department's choice. I think this decision was made in finance and probably prime minister's office. So the people that we worked for and we gave advice to in the employment and social development Canada department that Neil and I would get briefing by and we had a chance to interact with senior officials in that department. It was quite a it was quite a privilege in ways because we were kind of behind the curtain interacting with senior officials on some major issues. I don't think this was their number by any means. I think whatever they proposed got kind of chewed up. And what we saw in the budget was a decision made by the finance minister and her people with probably the implicit or tacit support of the prime minister. Um, and that's also very disappointing to think that this shows you that how low of a priority Canadians with disabilities and poverty clearly are if uh, uh, the best advice coming out of the department and the minister gets thrown out uh, by advisors in the prime minister's office and others thinking, let's throw them a bone. This is all we, you know, this will yeah. do. And yeah. uh, it was incredibly insulting. So that's why I, I felt I had to resign. Um, and yeah. so, uh, there you go. Uh, just to let one last thing, Neil and I wrote an op-ed, an editorial back in the summer of 2020, just mm -hmm. before the government in a throne speech, we argued for a, the need for a national income program. And we talked about it needed to be a, a robust poverty reduction program. And, you know, we, we didn't write in all the details, but we made a, and we were surprised, pleasantly surprised that that September in 2020, there was that idea was in the throne speech. Mm -hmm. and we were, okay. And they said, OK, it'll be modeled after the old age security and the guaranteed income supplement. Mm -hmm. Great. That's terrific. That means it's going to be a, a decent poverty reduction, as you say, Neil and Brent. Yeah. Once. Yeah. Because that kind of got shuffled out. Because that's that. uh, we should we should for, for the people that are watching, we should say that that supplement is about is around a thousand dollars or so. Right. Yep. Uh, it's about uh, yep. between a thousand and eleven hundred dollars. Uh, mm -hmm. per month for, for low income right? seniors. Yep. Yes. So, so Neil and I and others and mm -hmm. others on our, uh, that, you know, uh, uh, that they're still on that organization. Now, some people ask me, well, Michael, did you expect other people to resign from the group? I, that wasn't my expectation. Pretty well, everybody else on the advisor group represent organizations and memberships. And most of them also have working relationships with the government in other ways that I do not have. 
they have contracts and funding to keep the lights on and hire staff and they've got other concerns to think about than me i had i was kind of a free agent <laughs> and i've got another day job as a as a permanent academic so uh i I had that privilege and I used it in a way that I thought was going to help the, the community. And mm -hmm. I, I wasn't at all disappointed or surprised that there wasn't a, a lineup of people behind me leaving out, out the door as well. And so I think they will continue the good fight inside and that's fine. People like Neil and I are, are now on kind of the sidelines or we've got other opportunities and other ways to continue to raise our voices and to, uh, fight the fight you know i mean there's the regulations anyway i'll stop there i'm sure yeah, you might I, want to chime it, in too well i, I was gonna yeah. say i was gonna say uh and may, maybe you can speak on this neil or maybe not maybe not maybe maybe you have no comment on it but uh i'm i'm curious or i you know it it surprises me that we haven't heard anything from carla that that uh i mean hmm. you know maybe she's been muzzled uh <laughs> you know maybe she's been told not to talk but i i'm surprised that that she hasn't come forward and said something in that transition because uh, mm -hmm. she's been she's been really really quiet and i think she has to be brent or uh, neil yeah. um i mean she's the minister of sport now she's no longer the minister of uh, uh disability inclusion and diversity so it would be i don't think it would be good form for her to step into her colleague's portfolio and, and start talking about things she's no longer the minister there so mm -hmm. i'm sure she has some very strong opinions and i know that in her capacity as minister of sports she's going to be championing disability rights and and, and the, the disability portfolio there so i mean that doesn't surprise me and I don't think you'd see any minister doing that to a colleague, um, uh, you know, their fellow cabinet minister. Mm -hmm. So, so that's it. But um, just to, yeah, and further with Mike. So, the committee we are on, I, I stepped away in November of last year, um, you know, and I and I just uh, long before the budget came out and that type of thing. The, and it, it was just a good time for me to go from that committee there. But Mike's right; we made a lot of, of great really great recommendations um mm -hmm. you know during covid uh looking at that national uh, benefit scheme we cost out a lot mm -hmm. of stuff we spent a lot of time putting stuff forward that that, that we thought would be you know a, a good starting point and, it, and, and again uh, with uh, the Canada Disability Benefit and it coming out uh, nothing even remotely close to what anybody would have imagined and and quite frankly nothing even close to what the government said was going to happen right mm -hmm. uh, I mean this is nothing like like uh, that has been told to the disability community to mm -hmm. to people on the committees and, and this type of thing I was invited to go to Ottawa to the budget and I was always confident that, that, that there was going to be funding in the budget. I, I was sure of that. I, I thought they couldn't postpone it any longer. Uh, and when, when the invitation came to go to lockup in Ottawa, I mean, I've never been there before and I have never been invited. So I knew there was going to be some sort of announcement. And about 10 minutes in, I wanted to get out of there uh, because, you know, we got the, the information and we saw, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, up to $2,400 a year. Yeah. Up to oh. maximum, maximum, yeah. Yeah. and and using the DTC, and and again, it was just um, it was a uh, you know a gut punch to everybody just to see that thing happening there, and uh, and again, not in the spirit of what the the benefit was was intended to do, um, and um, yeah, so it's it's just. Uh, it's not a good situation and I can say this though when we're talking about you know the Canada disability benefit and medical assistance in dying with the Canada disability benefit I, I, I it's, it's actually I've seen the disability community more mobilized around that than than even with made made you know is always a very you know uh, prominent topic within the disability community but with this here universally I could, the disability community has stepped up and expressed their disdain their disgust and their um, I won't say frustration because that's putting it mildly uh, you know it, you know they've been they feel that they've been stabbed in the back the knife then has been turned and then when they're on the ground they've been kicked into the ditch and um, you know it's it's just uh, we're still struggling to come to grips with it, you know, and what's going to happen, you know, and then even with the information coming out and, you know, and I know that Megan had reported that, you know, uh, you know, that uh, they were going to do with the family income, right? Even though regulations haven't been developed yet, right? And mm -hmm. so we, we had to follow up with the federal government, you know, and say, hey, you know, this is what's being reported. This is what people are saying they've heard. Regulations aren't even done. 
how can yeah. this be? You know, where is this working cooperation with, with persons with disabilities getting their input and letting them tell their stories? You know, uh, you know, all these things and, 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 and certainly the message coming from the government hasn't been, as Michael said, hasn't been a great success. Um, you know, I, I've heard quite a few times that this is a groundbreaking historic uh, move. Historic, and, yeah. And it's, you know, the biggest line item in the budget, $6.1 billion. And, and, and the government's been called to task by, by the community, by reporters, by, by <laughs> almost things. everybody. So I'm still hopeful, and maybe I'm naive, but I'm still hopeful with the fall economic statement, Michael, and mm -hmm. and yeah. budget 2025 that there's still movement to go forward, yeah. and and I see now that the government has put out um, you know uh, emails or messages to say if you want to help with the design of the of the um, regulations. I don't know what that means though, because I suspect they're already done, and th they'll probably throw something and say, well, you know, something that's not really you know, that important necessary to the disability community. It won't be anything about money probably or eligibility or, or whatever the case may be. I, I just don't, I don't know. But the government needs to do something because I think they've realized that this is, you know, just a huge fiasco and the, and the bad publicity and the negativity of what's been done, you know, and, and rightly so, because it, like I said, it's contrary to everything that we've been told from the beginning. It's contrary to the promise of what this benefit was supposed to do. And this benefit was never going to eliminate the threat of MAID, like pulling somebody up to the poverty line. That's, that was never going to negate MAID and the threat of it. MAID, is, MAID and the disability benefits are two different things. Uh, you know, medical assistance and dying when the government, you know, is in the position of you know that have passed legislation to 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 uh, euthanize persons with disabilities who are not end of life you know had had you know uh, uh, delayed mental illness as a sole condition um, you know with recommendations from their their committees to look at mature minors children as young as twelve under track one which is okay. you know those that are terminal uh, but we know if that ever happened it would have been legal to track two we saw that with the Trushan decision that's exactly what would happen so for our perspective of course we're we're against made completely in that regard right and and and, and the Canada Disability Benefit even if it was ten thousand dollars a month still wouldn't negate the fact that the government has passed legislation to use nice persons with disabilities not in end of life so the maid would have helped people financially and may have taken some pressure off but even if it was a substantial you know benefit it wouldn't negate the fact that the government has passed laws to euthanize persons with disabilities not end of life at end of mm -hmm. life right and, and should they be in the business of doing that right mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, it, and it feeds into ableism it feeds into that yeah. perception of you know persons with disabilities that, you know really don't have a good existence shouldn't really you know if you know why would they want to live so mm -hmm. made was never going to fix that or, or, or the Canada disability benefit was never going to fix that we still have to have that fight ourselves yeah. and, and and Neil into your comments as well and, and thank you for those at the beginning about us we, we try to eat pretty level we don't we don't go on a line we don't call people names we don't uh, well tip I, I call michael prince quite a few names but, um, <laughs> but but typically we don't get into you know and we we try not to be too disrespectful mm -hmm. but we try to make sure the information that we give is accurate right we don't want to gaslight people we yeah. don't want to get people's hopes up and when people are, are you know putting stuff you know because we're we're we're, we're always you know fighting the fight and testifying and dealing with the senate and and the amed committee and, and you know talking about you know the perils of made um, both under track one and track two and when people start running you know for example with that um with the uh, mature minors they call them right so children under 18 uh, children under 18 possibly as young as 12 right mm -hmm. people will be posting that saying oh canada's now euthanizing you know children you know who are you know mm -hmm. 12 years old and this type of thing who are with disabilities that type of thing so we'll jump in and we'll correct that you know make sure that people know that that isn't correct this is not the law we'll say look at you know, a recommendation was made, Canada passed on it at this time. It's important to note that this recommendation was made because that in itself is alarming. Yeah. Uh, but gaslighting people and gaslighting the community saying this is happening doesn't help us because yeah. when we're advocating for change, you know, it gives it gives the pro-made enthusiasts, you know, power to say, well, you guys make up stuff no matter what you do, right? So, you know, this type of thing. But the interesting thing is there is, you know, the, the intersect of it is this, that, you know, within the... Ahmad committee there was three senators that were quite vocal about being very pro-made uh, you know and, and 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 you know almost had this 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 personal vendetta to 
get it done, you know, get mental illness as a sole condition, uh, advanced directives and, you know, all this type of thing. And now if you went back and I won't mention them, but it, they're easy to find. If you, if you went back now and you look at what's happening with the Canada disability benefits, you know, Silence yeah. from those three senators. Nothing mm-hmm. advocating, no disdain about the uh, low thing, nothing at all. So it's a, it's it's a frustrating world, you know, to see yeah. when you have lawmakers, you know, taking it to such a degree, like Michael said, you know, yeah. pushing it forward right away, right away. And from the indigenous side, of course, you know, uh, Made First came out in 2016. Uh, track two came around in 2021. The government is now engaging the indigenous side in the fall of 2023. So, you know, seven years later, they finally start doing some kind of engagement with indigenous people. And it's not uh, a very good engagement at all. So, I mean, there's so many things. I mean, and this morning I had the opportunity to testify to the Senate on the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People and talking about how it needs to be going going forward and what, what this true collaboration and co-design and, and, and co-collaboration, what that means. And I, and I highlighted two things that, that flies in the face of what's happened. One was the Canada Disability Benefit and two was medical assistance in dying, um, you know, and, and, and cautioning the government that, you know, if they're going to do this and it's going to take, you know, decades to achieve. Um, but they've actually have to listen to indigenous people with disabilities, persons with disabilities, take their recommendations, listen to their lived experience and act upon what they, what they're saying, or else if this becomes a performative, looks good on paper endeavor uh, and a checkbox. And I, and I gave them, I forget how many, I think it was like 13 recommendations, but the two cases I wanted to note about how this stuff happens and how, you know, the government says that they want to have good relationships and foster good working relationships. Canada Disability Benefit and Medical Assistance in Dying, you know, both the most recent fiascos, you know, from our perspective anyways, uh, that we've seen. So, Yeah, Yeah, you know, it's just so important. Thank you on that. Uh, It uh, it was so, um, I mean, so compelling hearing so many like lived experience stories from people of what they go through. And uh, I mean, I I see it on a daily basis. And I mean, and it's all about lived experience. And I, I just really wish that the, the federal government uh, would really pay attention to people with lived experience stories because, I mean, they brought them to HUMA. I mean, they brought them to the committee and, and they testified. Um, That's what I was going to bring up, Brent. So I'm, glad yeah. you're, I'm glad you're bringing it up now. Yeah, yeah and, I mean, they, they brought they, all their stories, I mean, forward. And it's like the, the federal government, it's like a slap on the face. They just kind of ignored it saying, yeah, whatever. I mean, we're going to do it our way. But that's not living to listening to the the people on, on the front lines, the front lines of the people with lived experience. Those are the citizens of Canada and they need to be respecting the citizens and with dignified, they, you know, live, let them live with dignity and respect. I mean, uh, indigenous, um, you know, um, people with disabilities. I mean, uh, everyone who, who is a citizen uh, is, uh, is supposed to be taken care of. I mean, they're supposed to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, you go ahead, Neil, on that. Um, Maths. Well, what one of the one of the things you always say, uh, Brent, and I, I, I know Michael, you said you mentioned earlier about the um, once you hit sixty five, you should be well taken care of. But uh, right. what one of the things you often say, Brent, is that disability doesn't stop at sixty five, and right. so exactly. so I, I just wanted to get uh, feedback from both of you as to you know. Uh, why? Because uh, I think I think there was a lot of uh, initial uh, pushback with the CDB. They were saying like a lot of people initially thought maybe that the CDB would never pass. The CDB would, would would never pass if if it would if it included uh, people over sixty five. Well, and, when, when number when number one on that one, Neil, um, is I remember. Um, an individual, and I won't, I won't say the person's name on the podcast, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, Mike, Michael, and Neil, um, and Neil, um, and you, you would know who I'm mentioning. But there's an individual who it turned 65, um, lost his disability status, but is a senior, but still has his disability, and he only gets these, I guess, CPP and OAS uh, and uh, GIS. Uh, a little bit of CPP. I don't know how much CPP paid into, but mm. I mean, it's not enough. Like it's not enough. Even what provincial was actually providing the individual with. Um, and uh, I, I did say to the person that 
I said, I will be bringing it up um, because, I mean, from time to time, as much as I can, because uh, disabilities don't go away. I mean, I yeah. mean, it's like a roadblock, 65. And the, oh, the, and the medical coverage has changed too, right? I mean, well, no, uh, it is. so, it so is. a, a lot of the coverage you get on, you get on uh, PWD all yeah, of a sudden disappears. goes away, right? Yeah, now mm -hmm. you've got to find that income to pay for it. And um, I'm not sure if it was um, you, Michael or Neil, who posted you know, the recommendation. When I was reading that, I was like, wow, like these are really awesome recommendations. And the amount that was recommended to the federal government was on top of the provincial disability. Mm -hmm. So it would have pushed it over $3,000 a month as a top up. And, and that, I, that sounds great to me. Well, yeah, but you know, when I, well, I think, I think Brent and, and Neil, I think, and Michael as well. Yeah. I mean, when we, and, and Michael and I, yeah. like, is, we spend a lot of time on this as well. And, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, making sure, you know, because you're not only looking at, you know, and, and particularly now, and remember when we started this, we weren't in the same financial crisis and inflation that, that, yeah. you know, when, when the CBD first came out. Yeah. So those numbers are, are probably low. Um, oh, yeah. And then when you look at the extra cost of disabilities and you look at the, 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 the rental costs, I mean, oh, my my gosh, just, yes. just amazing, you know, and, and, yeah. you know, how can, how can anybody, you know, survive and, and the grocery bills and everything else on it. Mm -hmm. So I think Michael, we, like we said, a generous um, earning yeah. exemption, you know, yeah. um, PT, uh, FTP, you know, if you're on that, you're automatically on, you know, mm -hmm. go forward. You know, we were saying, you know, it should be a, you know, so when we put that forward, it was, it was more because there's some provinces here in Canada don't have a disability program. They have yeah. income okay. assistance. So we're trying to balance that so that we would get somebody the minimum to the poverty line. Right. And the poverty line, unfortunately is is the goal to shoot for for some reason it can't be like above that and the government yeah. are like that right there's well let's get them to the poverty line and and of course that didn't happen um, and there's two calculations for that we should say too there's there's, there's a, a lyco and the mbm there, there's a lyco and the mbm and they're two two different yeah. numbers <laughs> and they're gonna call it the mbm yeah. And, and quite frankly, I don't know, maybe Michael does, yeah. what is the poverty line for the Canada Display Benefit that they're using? Do you know? Because I don't well, know. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just, you know, part of, part of our disappointment, and I guess it wouldn't, <clears throat> Neil uses the words like fiasco or a gut punch or a stab in the back. We, just to give, a, you know, concrete examples of that, this is this is the first new federal income benefit it, since we passed the Poverty Reduction Act in Ottawa in 2019, the government of Canada for the first time in history adopted an official poverty line in 2019, the market basket measure. They passed a law and they enshrined it. They have a poverty advisory council. This was the first benefit since then. We also passed in 2019, the Accessible Canada Act with a new progressive definition of disability. This was the first income benefit since then to so did we embrace the Poverty Reduction Act? No. Did we follow the Accessible Canada Act? No. And even the Canada Disability Benefit Act, which people like all you folks advocated, Neil appeared before them, I did, yep. and we got amendments. At first we're told, don't you dare amend the bill because if we slow it down, it won't pass, we'll never get a benefit. But anyways, groups, some groups said, no, hell no, we're gonna make some improvements. And you know, in Senate, we got some amendments where we said, in the calculation of the amount, we're not gonna tell you what the amount is because you told us we're not allowed to do that, but we're gonna get into the language. And Mike Morris, the Green MP and others followed on this, and we got support, was that the amount needs to be based and taken into consideration, first of all, the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Yeah. Yeah, Secondly, right. the Accessible Canada Act. Thirdly, the Poverty Reduction Act. And on top of that, to take into account the additional costs of living associated with living with a disability in this country, costs that are not reimbursed by other programs, costs that are out of pocket for people. And so, you know, you can use the market basket measure, which is the official poverty line now, but that does not take into account the additional cost. So we got that language into the bill as well. So we got that into the act. So along comes budget 24, Guys like Neil are in the lockup. They read the couple of pages about the new benefit. And of course he wants to leave after 10 minutes because 
Yeah. It's from an it's from another solar system. It's not yeah. even in this yeah. world. There's no mention of the Poverty Reduction Act. There's no mention of the UN Convention. There's no mention of additional cost of living. There's just this bizarre figure. Two hundred dollars maximum a month for some people next year, maybe. You know? Yeah. And it was yeah. like, what the hell happened? And, and, I, and, and I, I could just visualize Neil just scratching on the wall. Let me out. <laughs> I tell you, I, I it, uh, the, the, so I've been in the lockup here in BC, and it's a little bit different. Michael has, of course, yeah, too. Yeah, in BC, yeah. they they take your cell phone, they put it in a bag, and they you know yeah. they make sure you can't communicate. In Ottawa, they actually took my cell phone, had me turn it off, put it into a paper bag. Uh, or a paper, a manila envelope sealed that said embargoed and gave it back to me. And I tell you, I was well thinking, I got to go to the bathroom here and get this information out. <laughs> but it was just, uh, oh, yeah. no, but I, I wanted to get out of there. And it's, uh, you know, it, it's uh, like Michael said, it was so, so devoid from what anything anybody had recommended yeah. even at the yeah. lowest level no like yeah. nobody would ever say that um and you know when we and then once we got out and we were disembargoed or whatever they call it you know <laughs> and people were writing these these uh long um you know press releases you know expressing display i just wrote one line and that was the line words without actions are just wind and I said, read that. <laughs> and, that's, <laughs> that and that and that's yeah. it, you know, and yeah. um it's just uh but we have seen, and, and 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 that's why I'm hoping there will be a change. And and I'm not deluding myself to think that they're going to come out and say it's going to be a thousand dollars a month. I mean, uh, you know, yeah. um, but we've seen from this is a great thing to well, this is just the first step, <laughs> you know. So there yeah. has been some yeah. some change. I think the government has seen, you know, clearly you know the the disdain from the disability community disability organizations and, and allies and and are looking for some mechanism to address this and i hope they are anyway seriously um you know, but again with, with the uh, provinces too um see they all the provincial governments and territories that were waiting on the federal government also to come out with this historic canada disability yeah. benefit and then when they came out yeah uh, yeah obviously extreme disappointment i mean that's an understatement on the words that you know that we want to use, but um, I think that the the finance ministers and then the um, I guess the ministers who are in charge of disability programs in each province, I mean, they must have just been just shaken and trembling, going, "Uh oh, what do we well, do I, now?" I guess they didn't make rates. Yeah, I guess that's what so I you know I I was always kind of pessimistic. I mean, I wanted I wanted the CDB to be to be good, like when I first heard about it, I was like, I want this thing to be good, but I was always kind of pessimistic about it. And it, it because, um, and I, again, I don't know if you uh, both know this, uh, Mike and Neil, but, um, like I've had my survivor's pension clawed back for the last 10 and a half years as unearned income, like clawed back. Right. And I think, I think that's a huge problem with, the, with the provinces clawing back, so-called unearned income and i mean it's a pension you know a pension is supposed to be a protected income yeah. and yet the provinces are saying oh that's a protected income no it's not they claw it back and yeah. and yeah. uh you know and so that's that's a big you know that's a big no-no in my book mm -hmm. and and i think that's that's what i always saw saw, saw is like how are the federal government and the provincial government uh, like all the provinces going to coalesce and say you know this you know we're we're going to be like this and and you know agree and it's going to be great and there's going to be going to be no clawbacks or how 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 are they going to do that when they're already uh, there's a whole mess of all this clawback stuff going on like I, I i just that was the thing that really tripped me up i'm like how is how is that going to work well i remember yeah. way back no. when you know uh, like uh, sonia used to always say i'll believe it when it's in my bank account and i'm like <laughs> yeah. oh, I well, I mean, you have to be cautiously optimistic. And I used to say that on the on the show when we had it back on Twitter space, right? I bet, you know, we used to talk about basic income a lot and then uh, you know, talk about the Canada Disability Benefit. And I said, well, I'm, I'm being cautiously optimistic. Uh, and, you know, I mean, the devil's in the detail, should we say it, right? And I said, mm -hmm. a lot's been getting worked on behind the scenes, right? And, I mean, I got to hear a few little, you know, things here and there. And I'm like, well, but, you know, um, you know, I, I said, I don't know. I, I'll leave it to the experts to figure this out, right? And hopefully they'll do it the right way. And now fast yeah. forward you know, to... And I mean, that's the other thing I was going to add on to, too. Like, as much as I was pessimistic, I like I started to, to believe that it was, might happen because, you yeah. know, 
because I know that that you, Brent, and uh, you you met with, with uh, Jeff uh, Leggett. You you and Jeff Leggett met with um, met with the minister Sheila Malcolmson, and right. uh, and when you had meetings with her, she was always talking about poverty level. She was always take, she was taking the lower she was always taking the lower amount, saying we're we're looking at the MBM. MBM. We're yeah. looking at the MBM, which is the lower of the poverty level amounts, but that's, but that's, but that's, still. But still, it's like twenty one hundred dollars, right? So, yeah. so I mean, everybody kind of was thinking, like all the advocates, I think across the board, were kind of thinking, well, even if it's the lower of the amounts of of the poverty, mm. that's yeah. still going to be here in BC. That's still going to be an amount of say six hundred six hundred bucks. Yeah, I think it was twenty one oh seven was the uh, yeah. MBM level of uh, I think twenty of twenty twenty two or twenty. So, so I think er everybody was kind of thinking, well, okay, it's going to be about six hundred bucks, like you know. Oh, yeah. And I, th I think we kind of all had that expectation. I think that, so. That the the government was kind of going to do like the kind of the low bar, but at least hit at least uh, hit the the poverty level, right? <laughs> they did the low bar, all right. I mean, they yeah. did I think six dollars sixty a day. <clears throat> Yeah. Or some, or some. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think we're gonna have to wait until. I, I mean, I don't think any province is going to exempt it until actually you know the final result of what's going to happen because it impacts yeah. all their, all their other programs and that. And and now, I mean, even with the you know the government say, I mean, it, it's a difficult thing because even now, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I heard Manitoba said they would exempt it, but I'm not sure if that's true or not. Yeah. But they're exempting two hundred dollars if the government all of a sudden says in the fall economic statement we're going to boost it up to you know seven hundred and fifty, are they going to exempt that? Then they're going to say, yeah, we're going to do that. So I, I mean, government. Governments, provincial governments, territorial governments are hesitant to do anything because they just don't know what the number is. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, yeah. even though it's legislation, there's no program in place. I mean, it won't be in until 2025, so it's hard to make decisions yeah. based upon what you don't know, right? Yeah, right. But it, interesting, um, when you were talking there, Brent, um, uh, it, it triggered me um, when I, <coughs> excuse me, when I stepped away from the committee. It was yeah. directly after the fall economic statement when they did an interview with uh, Minister Freeland and she mm -hmm. said, and they were asked about the Canada Disability Benefit and, and she said, we can't fund everything. And that's when I said, mm -hmm. you know, I, yep. this is enough. And then that's when sure. I made the decision to to step away because I, I watched that and I went, you know, all the work and all the promises and everything that everybody's been doing, the expectations from the community. And and this is a public thing when, when asked about the Canada Disability Benefit and then I remember that interview too. Yeah, you, yeah, but yeah, when you were talking, that's what reminded me about you know what what really you know yeah. helped me make my decision at that time. Well, well yeah, because I remember when hearing back from that interview at that time, and I thought as soon as I heard that word, and I thought, well, okay, so people with disabilities are are just not worth enough that we can't we can't take care of them. So. Yeah, you know. <laughs> and the problem is, and we've experienced this, uh, and we've seen the success of this as well, is that you need people in government that care and that want to make a change. And we had people like that in BC, where, you know, uh, you know, Michael's a strong advocate, and, and we've seen yep. considerable change in his role at CLBC. Um, but we need allies in government and, and people that want to push it. And, and you know, and, and, and uh, Minister Qualtrough took a lot of heat because of the, the Canada Disability Benefit because of the delays. Uh, yeah. But really, she was a strong advocate for persons with disabilities. She wanted to move this forward. She wanted to see it getting done. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what you need in government. If, and, and, and unfortunately, federally and often provincially, territorially, we don't have those allies that are willing to really press it. Yeah. And, and like you guys said at the beginning, um, you know, they probably just thought this was going to wash, be no problem. People be happy with 200 bucks, but they've got a, you know, they got a surprise under that. Mm -hmm. But typically that's how it is within, you know, I think anyways, the perception within the disability community is, or the government to the disability community is, well, if we give them a little bit, they'll be happy. And then we'll just move on to something else type thing. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, the CD, the CDB was, uh, it was introduced as like in the spirit of the CRPD, right? in the spirit of the CRPD. And I mean, you yeah. can only say in the spirit of so many times before, <laughs> before it becomes kind of disingenuous, right? I yeah. mean, how many times can you say it and 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 not really mean it? Yeah. <laughs> and that, well, that's, that's my problem with it. When yeah. I read it, when I read the budget, Neil, and uh, they said in the spirit and I read the rest of it, I thought, well, I think they're using the word spirit in like ghost like, like this, this this is not this is not a real thing it's a phantom promise it's uh 
Yeah, I mean, that was one of the most insulting paragraphs I've read where they say, oh, yeah, we're embracing nothing without us and all that. But then it goes on to yeah. say, however, let's be clear, there's an envelope of money here and this is all there is. And we've already decided it's going to be the DTC and we've already decided the amount and we've already decided uh, this and that. But, hey, we're still going to do something with you. And, and that, it's that not everything. Us, not everything. That, that brings us. <laughs> that brings us back to the inter intersectionality, right? Because yeah. Yeah. because yeah. the government has decided that that the PWDs have this amount of worth. Way way down here, we have a worth yeah. way down here. And yeah. when you have yeah. a, when you have a worth that's way down here, that's when you have the narrative of made. Yep. Yeah. Starts to push up, right? Starts to bubble up. And, yeah. and that's what where you get the intersection and and, and yeah. you know yeah. and I I just think it's really kind of bad optics that they have yeah. they have made and and the CDB kind of yeah. being worked on at the same time but but it seems yeah. like they have they're have they're but, but, but putting more effort into the yeah. made yeah. part. Well, of, let me just, I, I just wanted to add something what Neil yeah. Blanche said about. Um, you know, needing strong champions, both at the ministerial level and, and certainly Carla Qualtro uh, was the voice on cabinet on this. Um, she used us on our advisory group in a very strategic way and bringing in other ministers at times. We'd have a chance to talk to the health minister and others to get them to hear the messages and hear the concerns of the disability community. So she used the group in a very sort of thoughtful way that way. Um, but I, I knew that uh, as we were approaching the legislation getting passed and we and our minds were turning to the regulation side and you know the it was decided again a, a key political decision was that this would be a framework piece of legislation we weren't going to try to put everything in the bill that would take too long and there was a worry that if there was another election the bill might not get passed so the decision was made let's keep it a short bill and we'll leave a lot of the details to the regulations so then the groups then very naturally said well, we want to make sure that the way the regulations get developed and drafted allow us to have a really meaningful role. Now, traditionally, that's not the case. Governments do not, you know, they hand those jobs over to the legal people, the lawyers and some of yep. the program specialists. It gets cocooned into a very closed and private process. So uh, one of those great questions of what if in history is, what if Carla Qualtro had stayed the minister? I think we wouldn't have seen a paragraph in the budget that we saw about, oh, we figured out all the details, but yeah, we'll still consult with you. I mean, yeah. I think even with Carla, there would have been a challenge in trying to figure out what does nothing without us actually mean in a regulatory design phase of policymaking. This would have been one of the first times that that would have been tested and it would have been exciting. I know it would have been frustrating, but it would have been exciting and it would have been, we would have got in with open hearts, I think. You know, yeah. uh, I have, I have, I do not have that same faith now. We've had a change in ministers. We've seen this announcement in Budget 24. I have nothing without us going forward. I think it looks a lot like the old ways of paternalism, being co-opted, compromising, and the government at the end of the day saying, "Well, this is it, folks. You know, uh, it's complicated." And so, yeah. um, you know, when you talked about the numbers of poverty reduction as it got lowered. I think the meaning of nothing without us similarly got lowered and lowered and is is at a different standard now. The other thing I just wanted to say quickly before we run out of time on the federal provincial relations side is that as you guys noted, as you heard the public retreat federally, yep. there's no doubt that provincial officials in confidential meetings with their counterparts of federal officials, you gotta know that federal officials were similarly signaling a diminished commitment. Right. And, as, and as provincial officials heard that retreating by Ottawa, their interest and commitment in the working together would similarly diminish, saying, oh, the feds aren't that serious. You know, right. first of all, we, we said, we thought, oh, they're going to be, maybe this is going to be seven, 800 bucks a month, maybe a thousand like the GIS. Well, first of all, the feds would have said, quietly, Neil, no, 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 it's not going to be like the GIS. So don't think of a thousand maybe six or seven hundred oh okay okay you know that's a start okay and then it's like well probably privately it probably then started to melt and then suddenly we hear uh as you said minister freeland's statement last fall we can't fund everything boom there's another yeah and then we see that 200 bucks a month maximum 
Ted, provincial officials, I think for some of them, that was the first time they heard that number. I don't think they were had any extra special heads up or insight than you or no. me. And no. so, well, as, as Neil Balaji said, they're still trying to figure out, well, what's our next step? What's our next yeah. move on this? We're going to wait and see because yeah. well, uh, this is this is so far off. What? So I think there a lot of federal. I, th I think a lot of provincial officials are going to say, we've been spinning our wheels for two years with with our fed federal counterparts as they retreated. Like, how do we how do we bargain on with a partner that's constantly retreating and backing away, not coming forward in a good way, but constantly diluting, constantly abandoning a previous statement like how do you make a deal with that kind of a set of partners so i don't blame the provinces that much on this because uh, i mean they all need to do more i get it yeah. but yeah. the feds have really they had an opportunity to do something in a collaborative cooperative way and they have yeah. effed it up big time <laughs> well yeah i Brown mean the bed so to speak <laughs> well that kind of goes yeah. with uh with something that neil and i talked about what uh, a few times in the last while um, on previous podcasts um where well, Sonia and I were told some information. We were at the BC legislature, and uh, we were we bumped into uh, the, the minister uh, for uh, you know poverty reduction, uh, Minister Malcolmson, and you know hello, hello, you know hi, and you know really really genuine, nice, and uh, but then we bumped into one of uh, one of the staffers and um, and said, well, you know, Brent and Sonia, I you know I, I want to tell you something, but I you know kind of looked around and took us aside, right? They didn't want to you know anyone else to hear. And we, Sonia and I sat on this information for like six weeks, yeah. six weeks. Uh, we couldn't say anything because we were told that okay, well you can advocate. I mean for sure, right? I mean you're not bound. To, you can't advocate, but you can't say where you heard this information from. Do I have your word? And I said yes, absolutely. So we, we did, and I, I was doing shows, and you know, and I, I couldn't really say anything, and, and I was like trying to bite my lip, going, mm, you know, and I sat on it, and it was like saying, well, yeah, again, yeah, there's going to be something in the budget, yeah, there's going to be, and I thought, well, wow, okay, is it going to be because you guys didn't give a rate increase this year, right? So because we didn't give a rate increase this year is because there's going to be something in the budget, and I, and, and again, uh, Michael, I mean. Uh, I, they, I believe that the minister and the staffers, they all thought that's what was going to happen. And it was a complete letdown by the provinces that uh, it was like almost, and I don't want to say it in a, in a bad way in case the, you know, the minister hears this river. I mean, but it was almost like, you know, egg in the face, right? To all yeah. the, you know, to all the ministers who, and, and all the advocacy groups and all the advocates, I mean, we all thought the same thing. We all thought the you know, federal government was going to do it the right way. And um, make it a, a great well, historic. And, and, e and even even your, yourself, Michael and 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 Neil. I mean, it, it's it's got to feel like egg egg in the face to you too, right? I mean, you well, know. Yeah. Well, we never expected this. We, we I mean, no. we, we never, we never expected. What well, another thing, though, and and, and this, that, and maybe get uh, uh, hear from Michael. So in the budget as well, you saw that uh, the government is going to give forty one million dollars for applications for the display tax credit. And so I've had opportunities to meet with different government officials since that time talking about that. And I said, well, what's your because in case people are watching, you know, and, and I'm sure many, if not all know, the DTC has no standard fee across Canada. Right. So you might have a relationship with a doctor. It might be nothing or it could be two hundred and fifty dollars. Right. It all depends. There's no standard fee. And of course, when you're you're living in poverty and you have limited resources, if it's five dollars, it's too much. Right. So the government's going to use that forty one million dollars to pay doctors, set a standard pay doctors. I don't know what what that compensation rate will be. In, yeah. in British Columbia, of course, when you apply for PWD, the doctor can fill up both for, sides of the form and they get the medical and assessor side, which I think comes out to like $225 or 220 at the end of the day if you do both sides. Yeah. I don't suspect the federal government is going has, has budgeted a rate at that level, right? Mm -hmm. wow. One of the number one concerns when we work with the, the, the Canadian Medical Association is doctor burnout from filling out forms. And now mm -hmm. they're saying, well, we're going to, you know, we're pumping all this money. We're, get, we're hoping to get all these new uh, people on DTC when the doctors are saying, 
that's our number one concern. We don't want to fill out forms. We want to spend time with our patients, with our clients, yeah. to help them medically, not filling out forms. And then we're, in a, of course, in an environment when very few people now have a family doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm like saying, and I said to them, well, this, is this kind of money? Can you use it for appeal? Can you apply as many times as you want? All these things, which are all unknown. Yeah, right. Yeah. But the first thing is, if you're a doctor and they're, and they're saying, we're going to give you 80 bucks to fill out the DTC. Well, good luck on that. <laughs> trying to get the DTC filled out. So again, we have, a, a you know, another initiative for a benefit that's supposed to help people that really doesn't help at all. <laughs> you yeah, know? Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, and that kind of goes with, um, like, I think something that Mike, uh, the MP, Mike Maurice um, had uh, mentioned in, uh, in the committee stage that he wanted to see it streamlined. He wanted to make sure that that yeah. anyone on provincial and territorial benefits would automatically get it and not have the, the DTC as a stumbling or as an accessibility issue where the people would automatically get it. And I remember like kind of looking back uh, way back when, I mean, geez, <laughs> um, I remember my family doctor, him and I sat there and discussed about the DTC because I said, I didn't know anything about it. I said, my bank keeps saying, get the RDSP. I said, well, what is that? Well, you need a DTC in order to get that. Well, how do I get that? Well, get your doctor to fill it out. So I'd go to him. He goes, I've already filled out. You've got, you, part of my language, you goddamn friggin' forms. Hey, I don't, he said, you're already disabled. You know, how, how many times do I need to keep saying you're disabled to the federal government? He goes, they can go to hell, Brent. They can go to hell. And he says, you're disabled in province. You're going to get whatever you need. And obviously not. Yeah. <laughs> so I would just say, I want to throw that out there. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but Michael's right. Yeah. I mean, when yeah. they announced it as the mechanism to get the the Canada Disability Benefit the DTC, yeah. like there's there's no way that any of us thought that would after after the fiasco fiasco with Serb, yeah. there's yeah. no way that we thought they would go back there. Or as he said, exactly. maybe they would, but it would also be CPPD veterans, you yeah. know, and everything yeah. else. You know, the whole array and yeah. saying okay, and 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 publicly state this is our first step. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. we're still working with the provinces. There yep. and territories, there are next step. But yep. to this say the DTC and forget yep. about everybody else, yep. I mean, it. it, it, it <laughs> well, there were there was tons yeah. of impact statements at, at, at Huma, uh, you yep. know, tons of Huge. tons of uh, impact statements and, and lived experience uh, shared at Huma, and it feels like none of that, none of that got across at all. You know, like it all went out the window. You know, it just because all like, because there was a lot yeah. that were saying, please don't it tie it to the part. to the GTC. And yeah. what did, what did they do? Yeah, you know. Yeah. And what's also <laughs> interesting is, you know, the one thing that if you look over the history of federal budgets during the Trudeau years, so since 2015, there's been a standard feature in every federal budget is a a gender based analysis plus. So they look at intersectionality. What does this what does this announcement or that announcement or this tax measure or this program mean for indigenous peoples, young people, new immigrants or refugees, women, people with disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. There's a section in this budget with some GBA plus analysis, but none with respect to the Canada disability benefits. So yeah, yeah the lived experience and the impacts were presented very faithfully at parliamentary committees. The question again is, where in hell is the GBA plus analysis or the impact analysis of the Canada Disability Benefit? Here's your first new federal income benefit program. And this is supposed to be historic. This is a oh, milestone, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Well, where's the analysis that goes with that? Where, which, what, what was your best evidence and thinking? Again, that tells me that what the department did was, was junked. And this was a decision made, you know, as you said, both a number of you said, when Christian Freeland said last fall, we can't fund everything. That was the stake in the heart. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 especially across the uh, disability community, as we know, there was yeah. that 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 hashtag that was going out that we developed it. Actually, where where it got developed was actually in in the original Twitter space where Twitter spaces, where this, yeah. where this uh, program yep. formed from. And we all figured, okay, well, what what name should we call it? And we'll call it after Serb. We called it Derb, right? Yep. Yeah. And it finally it trended so much on Twitter. It was just blasting Twitter, and it was one of the top trending yeah. uh, things on there. And it finally made its way up to Krista Freeland. And when when it was brought to her attention, she said, "Oh no, well we can't fund everything. Is yeah. that um, if we uh-huh. do this, then um, yeah, like yeah. me, it has to be one or the other. Like the Canada yeah. Disability Benefit or that one." And yeah. I thought, okay, when I heard that line too, I thought, okay, where is she going with this? Like people need help now. Yeah. Yeah. 
And kind of, it kind of goes with the last little point that I wanted to make on that topic was with the, the source that I heard the information from. And before we actually, before Sonia and I went away, it was actually a day before the, uh, this, the, the person came up to us at the legislature and said, oh, I have an update for you. I'm like, oh. So um, I asked, a, I, I actually uh, talked to uh, Canal. I said, oh, okay. Yeah, I, so I asked how much, how much is, was it going to be in the budget? Uh, I don't know. And yeah. like, what? And that was the response. I don't know. Well, now we do know. <laughs> Crickets, yeah. Yeah, so like, wow. I, mean, I, I was going to say we are at the top of the hour, Brent. So oh, okay. um, I didn't know if we wanted uh, to do closing comments for everyone, if anybody has sure. last sure. comments. Um, so we'll basically, I guess I'll, I'll pass it off to both the, um, well, both to Neil and, uh, and you, Michael, is where where do you like the crystal ball like magically <laughs> where, where where do you see i'll start with you first uh neil is where do you see things going um like forward uh i guess on uh, on the maid um situation um i guess federally and i guess uh through the counterparts through the provincial and territorial counterparts um do you see any amendments happening with that uh so i know there was some discussion about um passing legislation to expand that further into other categories? Well, or... what, what, just before you talk, yeah. I, um, one of the things that uh, surprised me that when we had, when we had Megan on is, is she said that they, they've even amended track one now uh, oh. to be right. kind of right. uh, more, more open. Oh, yeah. um, so, so under track yeah. one, I mean, you know, um, I, I mean, you could move to, to track one just you can just say, well, I'm, I'm refusing to eat or I'm refusing my medications. And all of a sudden that becomes, well, in, in the life situation. So they have the ability now just to transfer you over anywhere. So do I think if there's going to be amendments to it? I mean, if I listen, if, if, the, if the liberals don't form the next government, I've, I've heard the conservatives say that they will not expand made. Um, I haven't heard them say that they would repeal it. Right, particularly track okay. two. Um, so, you know, all things going forward with that regard, there's a lot of people that are, are very pro-made. And there's a lot of people that, that um, you know, for whatever reasons, they, they think, um, you know, uh, euthanizing persons with mental illness as a sole condition, not looking at the limited access to mental health services, particularly in remote communities. Uh, all those things, um, there's, a, there's a push for it. There's a well-funded lobbying group here in Canada that has lots of resources that most uh, organizations and advocates don't have. They have the ability to lobby government and to get in the ears of, of, of uh, lawmakers and, and push these things forward. And and quite honestly, if you've watched any of the, the committees, the AMIT committee there, they're, they're stacked with, uh, you know, pro-made, pro-government direction people, right? And and those of us who had concerns or testified were, you know, belittled, um, you know, dismissed, not called upon this type of thing. So do I think it's going to progress? I think there will be a strong effort to see it progress. Um, but we'll continue to to try to stop that, right? Mm -hmm. um, in relation to the Canada Disability Benefit, I'm going to keep up hope that there can be positive change. I, I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think it's, it's something that's that uh, in the short period of time that Michael and I mm. and, you know, and everybody else envisioned it, that it would be, you know, that the, the promises that were made uh, will come to fruition. Um, and that's very disappointing. It's, 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 well, disappointing. And that's being nice. Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's, uh, yeah. it, it's, well, quite frankly, it's, it's effing wrong, right? <laughs> and, and, and persons with disabilities, you know, living in poverty, this is not something new, um, you know, that, you know, there, there wasn't a sudden realization that, that, you know, uh, you know, persons live with disability across Canada live in poverty that also came out in, you know, 20, 20, you know, with the yeah. creation or the, 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 you know, the, the uh, development of the kind of disability benefit. This has been going on for decades. This has been going on for centuries. And we had the opportunity to finally do something that was really progressive and start to address it. Wouldn't fix sure. it. And getting to a poverty line is not the goal that we should be looking to, but it's the first goal. It's the yeah. first goal that would have made a difference in first people's step. lives tremendously, right? You know, and, and, and you know, and, and, and this go forward, and yeah. So I don't know. It's it's. Um, I, I got to hope for for good things. We're going to keep pushing for that, and and you know, the Canadian public needs to step up. They need to express their disdain. 
the Canada Disability Benefit was supported by all parties and the majority of Canadians. Why are we talking about this? Why are we talking about $200? Why are we talking about the DTC? This is something that should be, and you know, we're saying fund it to the PMOs or the, the, the parliamentary budget officer levels, like yeah. the, the maximum amount, you know, if we're going to go into debt, let's do it for something that's worthwhile and into, and, and you know, our Canadians, our, our brothers and sisters that have had to endure this for, for how many decades and centuries, yeah. right? Let's yeah. do something yeah. progressive yeah. now. So yeah. anyways. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, that, uh, I mean, like the channel can change on that. Like, I mean, the narrative, right. I mean, and you're, you're bang on on that because like things can change in a positive direction is that political will to actually make it happen. Um, and the opportunity is here now for uh, governments to do it from all stripes. And they, uh, they've shown, they, they both said, yes, like we all support it. And it's just, it's a shame that they, uh, the, the ones who decide that, yeah, we just don't want to fund it properly. Um, and you know what? And I have no time for theatrics from any party, right? Yeah. So I, like I've said, you know, get the leaders of each party to stand in the house, say, look, give the yeah. government your unwavering support to do what they need to do to get this in place. Then sit down. Don't use it as a political tool. Don't yeah. use anything else. Just do it and move forward. And of course, nobody does, you know, because yeah. it is all about politics. It's all yeah. about money. It's all yeah, about they that. They throw hand and, grenades at each other and just saying, yeah. And people are somewhere way down the road, way down yeah. the road. They're somewhere, you yeah. know, and that's, I mean, and, and and of course, you guys know uh, all three of you, and everybody watching know know that only too well. So, yeah, well, that's, uh, well you know, thank you on, thank you very much on that, Neil. Um, mm -hmm. That's nicely and rightfully said. I know, I'm sure that there's obviously more words that we would love to use yeah. <laughs> on that. I mean, me too. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's um, you summed it up really well. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pass the mic now over to you, Michael, and uh, your sure. your crystal ball how sure. you, how you uh, see yeah well just yeah just briefly because i think you know, yeah. you know covered quite a lot there and, and quite well yeah. um yeah you know part of the part of the disappointment of course going back to we, we were looking for a significant income supplementation program and as neil's quite right the first goal was to get to the poverty line that's not the end goal um and comparing it to the guaranteed income supplement for low-income seniors, when that was first brought in in the 1960s, that was assumed to be a temporary program mm -hmm. because we had just brought in the Canada Pension Plan around the very same time. Um, companies were introducing pension plans at work. The uh, RRSPs, Registered Retirement Savings Plans, right. were only about 10 years old when the GIS was first brought in. So there were uh, there were these other programs, CPP, uh, there was the old age security program, of course, there was going to be pension plans, there was people were going to save if they had the money through RRSPs, through tax, etc. So the idea of needing a low income targeted program for seniors in poverty was assumed that it would only need it for 10 or 15 years, because within a generation or so, most working families would have pension plans of their own. Well, that never came to fruition. And now we have this very robust meaningful GIS. What's interesting about the Canada Disability Benefit is no one's starting off with the same assumption that we did with seniors in poverty in 1966 when the GIS. No one's saying, oh, this is going to be a temporary program. This is going to be a permanent program, and we know it. <coughs> the trouble is uh, people uh, backed away from the commitment to a robust, serious initiative. I hope what this will do, if I look at the history of seniors benefits like the GIS is, uh, and, and, and I think Neil's absolutely right. This has energized or re-energized the disability community in a really interesting way. The disdain, the struggles, there's the frustration and, and despair, but there's also a, a renewed uh, commitment to political action and to advocacy and bring this to the attention of all Canadians. There's attention by the mass media, mainstream media here that I didn't expect to see as much of it as there has been. So that's given me some hope. I think it also translated to the, the political parties, seeing that they all supported this legislation in the first place. We'll use the next federal election and the one after that and the one after that and the one after that to keep campaigning about the CDB is not at an adequate level. Vote for my party and we'll raise it another 100 bucks a month or 200 bucks a month. That's what happened to seniors benefits in this country through elections in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, and into the 1990s. 
Now, seniors might be thought to be a voting block or that they vote a lot, but we've now got one in four adult Canadians self-identifying as having a disability with an aging yep. population that will only increase. Yep. So this is a constituency that is getting bigger, not smaller, and getting more vocal and more mobilized. And I think any smart political party is going to realize we need to have this as one of our top five party platform commitments. And we'll, you know, and we will embarrass the Liberals in the next campaign if, it, if that's what it is. They've given us an opportunity as another party to shame them and promise Canadians. Uh, no, it's all politics. But if that's going to be yeah. what happens, I'm not upset about that. If that becomes, if this becomes now part of what all parties need to think about <coughs> in campaigning in future elections, this will ensure that there's a political dynamic around the CDB. Now there's a, you know, so I, I'm like Neil, uh, we're here for the long haul on these battles. We're not here just for oh, yeah. a, sh a short time or a good time. It's for a long time. And, you know, you just, you just hold on to your values and your principles like you guys, and uh, you fight the good fight. And you realize, uh, you know, uh, history is on our side. History will judge this budget to have been a colossal failure on launching a new Canada disability benefit um, by a government that knew better and has done much better for other Canadians over the last eight or nine years. There's been some really progressive social policy under, and I'm not doing this as a political ad for the government or the Trudeau. But if, objectively, I look back over the last eight or nine years, there's been some important social progressive change in this country that this government has led. And that's what's so hurtful this time is that here's a group that they have literally dropped the ball on and left behind yet again. So we dust ourselves off, we, we, we patch ourselves up and we lean in again for the next round because this is an ongoing struggle, but it's, it's the right struggle to be part of. And that's why I'm so pleased to be on your show again, to be able to talk about these kind of issues. So thanks again, Brent. Yeah. Yeah, and thank you, uh, and thank you very much, Michael. I mean, you know, I echo exactly what uh, you and uh, and Neil have, have mentioned. It's like gloves off, like the gloves are <laughs> off. It's like yeah, it's um, because we have to hold them to accountable. We have to hold the, the the officials to account and say, you promised something, you now need to deliver on it adequately, not breadcrumbs or little crumbs here and there, you know, because it's not going to work. It, that doesn't help people's lives. And yep. live with dignity and respect and you know people should get to live uh with with you know uh, have autonomy and live how they want freely and be able to move wherever they want to within the country and not have to apply for disability every province they go to or have yep. all these thing blocks like we have that opportunity to uh to make something historic and we call yep. it yeah you know, and all those magic words that they, the officials always use. Oh, there's more to do. There's it's more to be, do. It's going to be transformative. Kicking the can down the road. Life changing. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Yeah. So I, I want to I want to thank you, gentlemen, for coming on today. And I guess my ending statement will be um, for anyone watching and or listening to this later on the podcast. Um, please like message your MPs, message your MLAs. Let let your provincial counterparts know that you're not happy with what the federal government has delivered in the Canada Disability Benefit. They can talk to their counterparts. Um, we can all work together to really push the, uh, you know, push the, the doors down, right? And yeah. this make this historic. Let's let's say like enough is enough, and we're not going to accept breadcrumbs. We're going to accept what the uh, feds promised. They need to deliver on it effective immediately. So let the MPs know that we need to see change happen. And we can make this historic if we all say together as a unite across Canada, like, let's, let's make things better for people. Let's make things better for our citizens, uh, Canadians with disabilities. And I want to thank my allies joining me today mm -hmm. um, because this has been great. And I want to do a follow-up with you in the near, or near future. Sure. Yeah, it was a great show. Yeah. Thanks. Guys. Yeah. Thank you. Guys. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Neil. I, yeah, I, yeah. Did, well, I did want to say something yes. quickly is that oh, uh, we, oh. I'm not sure if the chat was live or not. Um, we did have some technical issues uh, to launch the show. And somehow I think the chat got disabled as well. Uh, so if it is disabled, I can't see it. So I don't know if it's disabled or not. But uh, if it is, I apologize. It wasn't on purpose. Okay. <laughs> okay. So no problem. So, uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, it's uh, well. There's there'll be lots of opportunities. People can mm -hmm. chime in and leave comments uh, again yeah. on. Yeah. On
Okay, gentlemen. Okay. All, all right. Thank you, you very guys much. Take care. Take, take care. care. See you all. Yeah. Yes. Take care. Bye yeah. now. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.